The second reading is from the Gospel of John. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. You know, when I was a child, I thought the whole world was based on rules. Everywhere I turned, I ran into a new law, a new rule, a new way to be. Seemed like everybody had something they needed to tell me, from my parents to my Sunday school teacher to my classroom teacher to the woman down the street. Every adult said some rule or some law that I was going to have to go by. You got to close the door when you go to the bathroom. When you're eating, you have to use utensils. If you're going to put on clothing, it has to match. And certainly, lying was a terrible, terrible sin especially if you lied to your parents. Lots of do's and don'ts, yes and no's, rights and wrongs. But actually, as a child, you know, things cut that simply kind of gave me a sense of security. At least there were some rules to live by. At least there were some boundaries that could keep me together if I kept them. In fact, if I kept these rules and felt secure, I also felt secure because I looked around me and I knew all the community around me played by the same rules. So I knew I was part of this greater community. And In fact, as a child, knowing that I'm part of this greater community, playing by the same rules, it gave me a sense of who I was. I'm part of this community. I play by these rules. Everybody does. And because I lived primarily in a Christian world, I assumed all adults were a source of guidance and at times correction. Whether the woman lived four houses down or whether it was my mother. And then unfortunately, in some ways, I got a little older and things started getting a little more complicated. Suddenly in my life, there seemed to be an ever-increasing amount of gray area. The phrase, what if, suddenly became part of my life. And I saw that sometimes a particular behavior could be good, and sometimes exactly the same behavior in a different place was bad. Lying was still bad, except when making out your taxes or telling your neighbor all those reasons why you really couldn't come to their party. And oddly enough, the very people who told me that there were rights and wrongs, do's and don'ts, were the ones doing this. Suddenly, maybes crept into that solid yes and no life of childhood. Certain values held by the society at the time had become laws and those values were beginning to come into question. The treatment of blacks and women and Native Americans and heaven forbid they were being mistreated by Christians and somehow even supported the mistreatment pulling out pieces of scripture. Some churches I found out wouldn't even let me worship there. Although we were worshiping the same Savior. The followers of the Lord of Peace were being drafted, sent off to kill other people too far away for at least my age for it to make any difference whatsoever. Some of my friends left the country, others fought, and some of them died, not knowing why they were there in the first place. Sent by Christian people. 
And for me, it all made absolutely no sense whatsoever. It seemed to me at that point that either the laws were wrong or all the people were hypocrites. Law was defeating love at every turn, even in the church. And so, I left the church. I left the church. I left Christianity behind. Packed up all my Bibles and all the works of the great Christian leaders that I had scattered around my college room. Put them in a box and put them in the closet. In fact, I even started following another God, another religion. Because you see, I really honestly think there is something in the human nature that needs a relationship with God. And if it's the God that we can't get in touch with, we'll make a God just so that we can be in touch with one. And certainly in my generation, the gods that started cropping up when people started turning away from Christianity were the God of drugs and alcohol and radical movements. We needed to know that somebody was speaking the truth and it sure seemed like that group wasn't doing it anymore. But that also made us vulnerable to fall for anything. Of course, then that changed for me again. I mean, after all, I am up here. Uh, Something had to change. And yes, just like you imagined, it's because I fell in love with a Christian girl. (laughs) You may have had loftier reasons, but no, that was really it. I fell in love with this Christian girl, and then it really got confusing because she seemed to be trying to live a life according to what I thought thought I remembered Christianity was all about. So I went back into my closet, opened up the books, pulled out the Bible that was on the top, started with Genesis 1-1 and read all the way through to the end of Revelation. And all the time I'm reading, I'm going, why didn't they tell me this was in here? Why didn't I know that this is what Christ said in that situation? How come I never heard this part of the gospel? What I also read was how traditions of the time of Christ have been turned into laws. And we all know that there are the overt laws. You know, those are the laws on the books. But most of us live a life influenced by the covert laws. Things that we know we really shouldn't be doing or should be doing. You see, these traditions... These laws, even when they brought security and community and identity, somehow had come to a point where they were blocking the higher calling of the love of God. There was something missing. You see, the law was good at the beginning, just like it is in bringing up a child. The law was good in the beginning. But it was actually, we remember, the law that nailed Jesus to the cross. It was by law that he died that day. And so I then realized, and it is in Scripture, that there are times that you must move the law to one side so that you can follow the way of love. Well, at that point in my Christian upbringing, I loved Amazing Grace. I loved all versions of it. You know, the kind that clip along, amazing grace, how sweet. And then the other kind, that could probably take you half an hour to finish. I loved it every way you heard it because it was all about my grace given to me. I loved what a friend we have in Jesus. I imagine walking down the path with Jesus, sharing my cares, and Jesus patting me on the back and saying, Ed, it's all going to be okay. Don't worry about it. I was loving God. God was loving me. And I'd, all I needed to do was follow his directions. In fact, we get that in John, don't we? In the Gospel of John, that's exactly what Jesus is telling the followers. As you love me and love God, so we love you and your new... Wait a minute, that's new. New. You see, 
When Jesus came back after the resurrection, pardon the phrase, he came back a new man. And he had an additional and summary message to tell all of us before he finally left. He said, you got to love each other. And when people see the way you love each other... By the way, you notice he did not go through all the laws. He didn't repeat the Ten Commandments. He didn't go back through the dietary traditions. He didn't go back and say all of the wonderful books of the Old Testament summing up all the laws. All he said was, love each other. It is the kernel. It is the core. It is the essence of faith itself. And then I need to go. I need to go because there's another step in this process. You've had the law for thousands of years. You have now experienced what the kind of love God would have us feel for each other. But that's not the end of the story. This is a three-act play. There is a third step that needs to be acknowledged. It is when the Holy Spirit's going to come. It was time to take in all the God-given laws, all the Christ-given ability to love, so that we might now step into living life. Life as God intended it to be for us. Not Blindly following laws, earning our way into heaven, not loving everybody because we had to, but moving into life in all of its fullness and abundance. You know, this is the reason why the Jewish Christians got so upset with Peter. Peter got the message. Peter decided he was going to go out and let the Gentiles into this wonderful life-giving faith. And they didn't even know the Old Testament. Probably never met Jesus of Nazareth. How in the world could we include those folks? Peter told them how. God told him in a vision that the laws that they had practiced no longer held. They had served their purpose, but now it was time to move on. Jesus had taught the apostles many things about God's love, and they loved him for it, but it was time to move on to that next and final phase of faith, the age of the Holy Spirit, where all people, all people, all people are welcome into fellowship. In fact, I love Acts 11.15. By the way, Bill, the reason why I gave you that one was because it was longer than the one I was going to read. So I just want to let you know, okay? (laughs) Little hint into how I work things sometimes, all right? 11.15. Peter goes into this Gentile house, and what does he say? He says in the middle of telling the gospel, the Holy Spirit came down on these Gentiles just like it had done on them on the day of Pentecost. If you want to find the time that we Protestants should probably say was our birth as a church, it really is Acts 11.15. Because when the first Pentecost came, it came to all those Jewish guys, those who were already kind of in the faith already. These were people that didn't have any faith at all in Christ until Peter showed up. And they brought their unique faith, their unique perspective to what it meant to be a Christian. Apparently now the Holy Spirit can come directly to anybody. You don't have to have a specific gender, cultural background, skin color, educational or economic level for the Holy Spirit to find you a valuable part of the community of faith. All these things, by the way, are totally law-based decisions and hold no place in the kingdom of God brought to us by the Holy Spirit. And what's our proper relationship with all of our newly created brothers and sisters, people that we don't know, people who may even be practicing other faiths now should be seen as brothers and sisters and treated as such. 
We are to love them as Christ loved us, as unworthy as we were and are today. To complete and fulfill our relationship with God, we must move from laws, then to love, and then finally to living a sacred life. Now, there's a trick in this. You know, the old guy's always sneaking around, ready to whisper a few things in our ear to stop us on this path. And let me tell you what the old guy's going to say. He's going to say, you know, it's not easy to do this. It's going to be tough. And so, you know, I really think it would be easier to go back and worship as if we were still a law faith. Go find yourself a church that has a checklist. Go find a church that decides whether you're holy and sacred and worthy of being praised based on how good you're doing and how many times you show up to church and somebody checks you off in the church attendance and how many verses you can quote from the top of your mind. Go back to that law base. You'll feel a lot more secure back there. But we're past that now. We can't do that anymore. We can't hold that up as a way of showing ourselves to be more righteous than anyone else. The true love of Christ reminds us nobody can finish that checklist, so why even pull it out? We are called now not to be children who need directions of the law, nor are we called any longer to feel the milk of the heavenly Messiah constantly rocking us in the gentle immaturity of our faith. Paul told us there was a time for milk. There was a time for milk. It had its purpose. It had its place. But now it's time as adult Christians to chew the meat. Gristle fat and all. To chew the meat of faith. To stand tall in the strength of the power of the Holy Spirit. I had an interesting conversation with a couple of you at times when I used the phrase children of God. And One or two of you say, you don't really like that phrase. And to tell you the truth, today I'm going to agree with you. As I'm looking at this scripture, we're not supposed to look at each other as if we were still children of God. Because if we do, we'll still act like children in faith. I think what we're called to be today is to be adults of God. Fully fleshed out, willing to arm wrestle the things the world throws at us with the power of the Holy Spirit to stand tall, say the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and say, we stand. Here I stand. Good old Martin Luther. Here I stand. I don't need to be rocked anymore. I don't need to be spoon fed anymore. I don't need to sit around and have everybody pat me on the back because they love me as much as I love them because Christ even told me in Scripture, if you only love the people who love you, it don't mean anything. So we are being called to be the body of a mature, adult Christ who walked into homes where at times he wasn't even wanted to meet with the worst sinners available at the time to address head on the challenges to Christian living in the world today. We are called to find our security now in God, our identity in Christ and our community not here but in the world. From law, with love, to life. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for the laws that you gave us, that bring us up and tell us that we are a part. And Lord, we then give you thanks for the love that you gave us. Not only that we are a part, but we are a cherished and beloved part. Lord, also we give you thanks for life in its fullness. With all of its challenges, all of its threats, and even times as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, our temptations. 
Because as adults, we realize we often don't know where we stand unless something tries to topple us over. So, Lord, we ask you to bring it on. Bring on that adult faith so that we might find the fullness of life embedded within it. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn of invitation, and for those of you who are now looking at the bulletin and maybe blinking a few times, the hymn of invitation is placed at this point after the sermon because if there are those who wish to become part of this worshiping community, there can be no better way of sharing a common experience after that profession than in communion. And so we start our hymn of invitation, number 589.